Okay, before we start, uh, let's just announce that um, because exam four is next Monday and Tuesday, please notice it's only available two days because the testing center is not open on Wednesday. They closed early to prepare for finals. Uh, so you just have two days to take that exam. So that's not my fault, but uh, please be aware of that. Um, so we will need to have our uh, Zoom question and answer review session before that, uh, which means we'll have that Saturday at uh, 10 a.m. So I'll send the link out to that probably on Friday. Uh, also Friday afternoon, uh, late Friday afternoon, we will have the uh, review, the, the, the topics review filmed and posted. So you'll be able to take a look at that, uh, hopefully before uh, we do this uh, Zoom review on Saturday. Uh, the exam uh, will not cover all of chapter 31. We'll address that at the beginning of class on Friday. I'll tell you how far into chapter 31 the exam will go, okay? Because, uh, uh, you know, we, we just don't have a ton of time, so we, we can't cover all of 31 before uh, the exam. Um, so today we are going to finish chapter 28, so we will start uh, 31 on Friday. Uh, we'll focus on our two remaining classes of... Uh, non-hydrolyzable lipids, the terpenes and the steroids. And we'll talk a lot about their biosynthesis, uh, actually both with the terpenes and with the steroids. So terpenes are lipids that are comprised of repeating isoprene units. And I've drawn for you here what isoprene is. Isoprene is simply a four carbon chain with a one carbon branch, okay? Uh, and terpenes link these isoprene units together in various ways. You'll always have carbon-carbon bonds connecting your isoprene units, but they can be sigma bonds in some cases, they can be pi bonds in some cases, they can be a chain, uh, they can actually be connected in the form of a ring, um, and while the isoprene units are linked together uh, by carbon-carbon bonds, you can also have oxygens attached to terpenes. So you'll have alcohols coming off of certain carbons. Uh, in some cases, you'll have aldehydes or ketones. Uh, so you end up with a great diversity of structures based on a single simple building block. One skill that is important to have in regards to terpenes is being able to count and locate the isoprene units. So being able to look at the structure of a terpene and determine how many isoprene units there are in that terpene and where those isoprene units are located. So we're going to practice this skill. Let's get out our eye clickers. You'll notice we've drawn for you vitamin A. Vitamin A, in addition to being a fat-soluble vitamin, is also a terpene comprised of isoprene units. So please go ahead and talk to your neighbor uh, and determine how many isoprene units there are in vitamin A. As always, you guys talk very quietly. Get out that eye clicker. Thank you. 
All right, let's try to get those final answers in in the next uh, 10 seconds or so. All right, are there any more answers? Going once. There's another one. Going twice. They have a four carbon chain with a one carbon branch. Okay, going twice. All right, we'll stop it. How many isoprene units in vitamin A? Four isoprene units. Yes, very good. So who would like to tell us where they started. So the, 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 the best way to do this is to start at one end of the molecule and pick one isoprene unit uh, and then figure out where the rest of them are. So, so would someone like to tell us how they started? Okay, Sydney? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, so you started on the right. You took a bit of a shortcut by counting the methyls to kind of indicate the branches, and that's okay. You can do that. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and just start here from the right and count one, two, three, four with our one carbon branch. So here's isoprene unit number one. And I told you that the isoprene units can be linked together by either carbon-carbon sigma bonds or carbon-carbon pi bonds. We can see in this case, we have a pi bond linking two isoprenes. Uh, so then we go one, two, three, four with our one carbon branch. So there's our second isoprene unit, uh, also linked to the next one by a carbon-carbon double bond. One, two, three, four with our branch. There's our third isoprene unit. And then we go one, two, three, four with our branch. So notice one of these methyl groups is in the chain of an isoprene and one of them is a branch. Okay, so that gives us our four isoprenes. So you count one, two, three, four branches, and then if you realize that one of those methyls is part of the chain, that's kind of a shortcut way of, of getting to your four isoprenes. You could also just count all the carbons and divide by five uh, if you assume that all the carbons come from isoprenes. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you, you might have a, car, a couple carbons chopped out, for example, so that doesn't always work. Uh, but one principle, one thing you'll notice, hopefully, as we went through this exercise, is that each carbon is only part of one isoprene. You will never have a carbon common to two different isoprenes. It's always going to be part of a single isoprene. And another thing you'll notice is that because we have a ring here, these two isoprenes are linked by two bonds. Right? They're linked by two carbon-carbon sigma bonds. And then our other isoprene linkages were carbon-carbon double bonds. Okay? So this variety in linkages, how these isoprenes are linked together, uh, gives us a great variety of structures. So we have a slide that shows us uh, a few other uh, common uh, terpenes in nature. Uh, and what we have here are the individual isoprene units shown in red. And we have the uh, bonds joining them together in black. Okay, in this case, they're typically sigma bonds, unlike what we saw in vitamin A. Uh, we have those in black linking these terpenes together, okay? So we have cyclic structures, we have acyclic structures, we have a range, uh, a range of organisms that produce these types, of or, uh, these types of molecules. Squalene present in shark liver oil. Uh, it's also present in lots of other substances. We have squalene in our bodies. We'll talk about that, about what we use squalene for. So that's produced by a lot of different uh, animals. Uh, but then a lot of these terpenes are coming from plant sources uh, because they're largely nonpolar in nature uh, and don't have a lot of hydrogen bonding functional groups. Uh, they tend to have low boiling points. They tend to be low boiling liquids. Uh, and many of them are part of a class of molecules known as essential oils. Uh, and so because they're low boiling, uh, they're sometimes fragrant. Uh, and so uh, the term essential this is important, the term essential refers to them being essential to the organism that produces them, not necessarily essential to human consumers. Yeah. And uh, of course, there are lots of companies that sell essential oils, uh, and uh, I must confess I'm not familiar enough with those products to know whether they're uh, legitimate or uh, 
boosted by marketing. But uh, just remember that the essential only refers to the organism that produces it. Okay. So uh, there are also classes. You can classify our terpenes according to the number of isoprenes that are present. Uh, and the smallest class of terpene contains two isoprene units. Okay? So that is why the name monoterpene applies to a molecule that has two isoprenes. Okay? That seems unusual, but that's because that's the smallest terpene. So because a monoterpene has two isoprenes, that means that a diterpene has four isoprenes and a triterpene has six isoprenes. And then these ones that are in between that have three and five isoprenes have weird names, sesquiterpene and sesterterpene. Uh, so please don't memorize these names. Uh, you're not going to need to memorize them for the class. Uh, but if you read the organic chemistry literature and you read about terpenes, you'll see these terms. They're very, very commonly used. So you don't need to memorize them. But it's helpful to know where to look uh, if you see a term uh, and you want to know how many carbons are in that molecule or how many uh, isoprene units are present in that compound. Any questions? So let's talk about how terpenes are synthesized in nature. So terpene biosynthesis is one of those processes that is simple yet highly efficient. So it, it, in my opinion, it really shows the elegance of nature uh, that these uh, terpenes are made in such a fashion that we can get such a variety of complex molecules via very, very simple chemistry uh, that we actually learned last semester. So we're only going to see reactions that we learned last semester uh, in the synthesis of terpenes. They're very, very basic uh, organic reactions. So there are two isoprene building blocks that are used to generate terpenes. And we start with acetyl coenzyme A. We talked about how this molecule was made uh, on Monday. The fatty acid beta oxidation pathway generates acetyl coenzyme A. Uh, and we're going to use three molecules of acetyl coenzyme A. That's six carbons. So obviously one of those carbons is going to be uh, removed at some point. Uh, but through a process we aren't going to go over, uh, nature takes these three acetyl coenzyme A's and turns them into two molecules that have the isoprene skeleton. Okay. Whoops. I was jumping the gun there. So this molecule is called dimethylallyl pyrophosphate. So this group here is known as the pyrophosphate group. And you see dimethyl allyl. It's an allylic pyrophosphate. Uh, and then the other building block that we get has the same skeleton, the same isoprene skeleton. It just has the double bond in a different location. And that, of course, is by design, as we will see when we discuss the biosynthesis, okay? This molecule is called isopentenyl pyrophosphate. So the pyrophosphate group is often abbreviated as OPP. So we could call this isopentenyl OPP. We actually learned about the uh, pyrophosphate group briefly last semester. Does anybody remember what its function is in nature? It was a long time ago, so if you don't remember, it's not, uh, uh, not to be alarmed or be surprised. Uh, it is a biological leaving group. So when we learned about substitution chemistry, uh, we spent a little bit of time talking about substitution chemistry in nature, uh, and we learned that pyrophosphate uh, is used as a biological leaving group. Uh, it fulfills the number one characteristic of a good leaving group, which is that it is not basic. Okay, So we could have a nucleophile 
This can be done either in SN2 or SN1 fashion. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to show it in a single step uh, instead of a two-step process. We have our substitution reaction occur. And then we have our pyrophosphate leaving group, which actually has three negative charges in it. But it is not basic because those negative charges are resonance stabilized. They can be delocalized onto other oxygens in the molecule. Uh, as evidence of the fact that it is not very basic, it's drawn in this form with these three negative charges because that is the dominant form at the essentially neutral pH values that we typically have inside of our bodies. At physiological pH, pyrophosphate is going to have these uh, uh, three negative charges. Uh, and because of the resonance stabilization, the delocalization of those negative charges, it is not basic and is therefore a good leaving group. And so uh, it will function as a leaving group uh, in both SN2 chemistry as well as SN1 chemistry. Okay? So we're going to take a look at how nature uses these two isoprene building blocks with just one difference in the structure, the location of the carbon-carbon double bond, uh, to synthesize terpenes. So here's kind of an outline of the process, uh, and then we're going to look at the mechanism. Uh, so we take these two, dimethylallopyrophosphate, isopentenylpyrophosphate. Uh, we link them together by a carbon-carbon bond, losing one of the pyrophosphates. And that gives us geranyl pyrophosphate, a C10 molecule, uh, which is then the precursor to monoterpenes. Enzymes will transform geranyl pyrophosphate into monoterpenes. Alternatively, we can attach another one of these units. It's actually going to be another one of these isopentenyl pyrophosphates to the geranyl pyrophosphate, and that gives us farnesyl pyrophosphate. Okay? You don't have to memorize these names, but uh, you'll see them if you read the literature. Uh, and so this one uh, gets uh, converted into sesquiterpenes with 15 carbons, uh, or you could add another 5-carbon unit and convert it into diterpenes. And then we dimerize farnesyl pyrophosphate to generate squalene, which has 30 carbons. And so squalene is going to be the precursor to triterpenes. And as we'll learn later today, it is also the precursor to all steroids. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we form these carbon-carbon bonds between these two isoprene uh, molecules? It's very, very simple. So... If we have in our, uh, the key feature of our dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate is that that pyrophosphate is allylic. And so if it leaves, if the OPP leaves, we generate a resonance stabilized carbocation. Okay, so we see that resonance stabilized carbocation. Uh, and we've seen this before. We've seen allylic leaving groups depart and give us resonance stabilized carbocations. Uh, even though that carbocation is resonance stabilized, it's still high energy. If you were going to do this in a flask, you would require heat. You'd have to heat it up to provide the energy, because that's an endothermic step, for that allylic carbocation to form. Uh, but in our bodies, we don't have a hot plate we can turn on to provide the heat. That doesn't work. Uh, and so what we have is an enzyme instead. So... Uh, and that's good because we wouldn't want allylic carbocations just forming indiscriminately all throughout our bodies. We would want to be able to control the formation of these allylic carbocations and have them only form at the times and in the places that we need them. So uh, we will have an enzyme, uh, and the active side of that enzyme will stabilize the two products of this reaction. It will stabilize the allylic carbocation, and it will stabilize the pyrophosphate. So it's going to have functional groups, presumably from the side chains of the amino acids at that active site, that are going to engage in ion-dipole interactions or hydrogen bonding interactions, other sorts of electrostatic interactions to stabilize these products. Right? So if we can stabilize the products of an endothermic step, we'll be able to lower the activation energy for their formation according to Hammond's postulate. Okay? Uh, so that's what's happening here because of Hammond's postulate. Stabilizing these two ionic products is going to allow 
the uh, allylic carbocation to form at our body temperatures in the confines of the active side of the enzyme. Okay, any questions? Okay, so once we get that carbocation, that's a good electrophile. Uh, we also learned in uh, 351M that alkenes are typically nucleophiles. Most of our reactions of alkenes use the pi electrons of the alkene as a nucleophile. So the pi electrons of the isopentenyl uh, pyrophosphate are going to attack the resonance stabilized carbocation. Uh, why is it attacking in this manner? Why is the new carbon-carbon bond being formed from this carbon instead of that carbon? Okay, it could be sterics. There's another reason too, but that's one, yes? Yeah, we generate a tertiary carbocation. If we use the pi electrons to form the carbon-carbon bond from the terminal carbon, what we're left with is a tertiary carbocation. Yes? So you have to be careful. There's only one carbocation represented by two resonance structures. So you have a single carbocation that has positive charge shared by those two carbons. What the enzyme active site does is hold that carbocation in a location such that the terminal carbon is the one that's close to the, nu the incoming nucleophile. But be careful. There's only one carbocation represented by those two resonance structures. So you can see here the reasons why nature uses these two building blocks that differ only by the position of the double bond. Our dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate is always going to be the electrophile because it has an allylic leaving group. That allylic leaving group can pop off and give us the allylic carbocation. The isopentenyl pyrophosphate is always going to be the nucleophile because the isopentenyl pyrophosphate has this 1,1 di-substituted alkene. When it acts as a nucleophile, it leaves behind a tertiary carbocation, right? Our most stable form of carbocation that's not resonance stabilized, okay? So these two structures are ideally suited to be an electrophile and a nucleophile. And that's indeed how they react to form this key carbon-carbon bond uh, in geranyl pyrophosphate. But we're not done yet. We have a tertiary carbocation. That certainly does not remain in the product. We learned last semester that carbocations can either undergo substitution reactions or they can undergo elimination reactions. They can react with nucleophiles by substitution or with bases by elimination. Let's look at this tertiary carbocation. How many different alkenes could we form by deprotonating that tertiary carbocation. Okay, I see two, I see three. Uh, how about five? There's actually three constitutional isomers that you could form by deprotonating any of these uh, uh, beta hydrogens. Uh, but if you have a double bond here or here, you actually would have E and Z isomers. So you could get a total of five different alkenes from that compound, okay? But we only get one, why? The enzyme, the enzyme active site, uh, has a base in the right location to deprotonate this beta hydrogen uh, and give us the uh, double bond in the right location, an allylic double bond. So if geranyl pyrophosphate is going to react again, is it going to react as a nucleophile or an electrophile? An electrophile, because it's got that allylic leaving group, okay? Uh, and, and we only get the... So you could argue, if you look at this uh, carbocation, you could argue that you, you wouldn't want to deprotonate here because that would just give you a di-substituted alkene. Uh, but you could still deprotonate here or here and get a tri-substituted alkene. So you still have two choices of sites where to deprotonate as well as uh, E or Z isomers. And we only get one of those. And so that's due to the control of the enzyme active site. Okay? So very simple chemistry. Formation of an allylic carbocation, use of uh, the pi electrons of an alkene as a nucleophile, deprotonation of a carbocation to form a new alkene. Very, very simple uh, chemistry we learned last semester, uh, but uh, 
nature has very efficiently designed these two very simple and only slightly different molecules to function in this reaction uh, with the dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate as the electrophile, the isopentenyl pyrophosphate as the nucleophile. Any questions? Okay, so uh, if we wanted to make farnesyl pyrophosphate, the one that has 15 carbons, we would need to add five more carbons. We already mentioned that geranyl pyrophosphate would be the electrophile. It could go through the same steps, the same three steps. We would need another molecule of isopentenyl pyrophosphate in order to do that. And that would give us farnesyl pyrophosphate, the structure of which we see here on this slide. Okay. And then farnesyl pyrophosphate can be used to make sesquiterpenes or diterpenes, uh, but it also is the precursor to squalene. Now you notice uh, that we form squalene from two molecules of farnesyl pyrophosphate. If you look at the structure of squalene, you can see we linked C1 of the farnesyl pyrophosphates together, okay? That should bother you. That should kind of make you cringe because these are both electrophiles, right? We lose these leaving groups, uh, we get these carbocations. You cannot bond two carbocations together, right? They would, they would go their separate ways. They would repel each other. That, that's not going to work, okay? So this is not a simple step. In contrast to what we've seen so far, uh, simple steps, this one is a very complicated step, okay? So there was a chemist at the University of Utah named Dale Poulter who many, many years ago uh, studied the biosynthesis of squalene and worked out the mechanism for the dimerization of farnesyl pyrophosphate to squalene. And uh, if you ever look it up, you'll be thankful that we're not teaching it to you today because it is a very complicated process. Uh, it involves the formation of a three-membered cyclopropane intermediate. Uh, it involves a reduction reaction mediated by NADH. So it is a complex multi-step process. And the take-home message is it's very hard, even in nature, to make a bond between two electrophilic carbons. That's just not something that these molecules are designed to do. And so we have to have a very complicated process to link those two carbons to make squalene. So we're not going to discuss it. We'll just let you know it's complicated. If this bothers you, it should. That's a good thing. It means you've learned something uh, this year uh, in the class. All right. So um, squalene, well, before we talk about squalene some more, uh, let's just look here and see how uh, some of these molecules can be transformed into terpenes. So here we have geranyl pyrophosphate. We can have an enzyme isomerize that double bond. We can't isomerize that double bond without an enzyme. You can't just heat the molecule up and have the double bond isomerize. You'll notice we're going from E to Z. This one's going to be more hindered. So we're, going, we're fighting against thermodynamics to do this. Uh, so we have to have an enzyme help us. Uh, but after we perform this isomerization, uh, the leaving group can come off, again, assisted by the enzyme, stabilizing these products. But because we've isomerized the double bond, now this positive charge is in close proximity to the pi electrons here. And so those pi electrons can attack in an intramolecular fashion, uh, generating this tertiary carbocation. And of course, uh, we know that uh, tertiary carbocations uh, are able to either undergo nucleophilic attack or elimination. And both happen in nature, depending on which enzyme you're using. You can have water attack, and then after proton transfer, you would get alpha terpenol, or you can deprotonate, uh, and we're deprotonating from one of these methyl groups, not getting the alkene. We're not following Zaitsev's rule in this case. Again, the enzyme allows us to do that, uh, generating this uh, disubstituted alkene and limonene. Okay? So the enzymes control these steps. These are relatively simple steps, except for the isomerization but they're controlled by the enzymes to give us the products that we need. Now, um, on this figure, it's not shown, but if you look closely, you'll see that alpha terpenol is chiral, limonene is chiral. These are stereocenters. These pyrophosphates are achiral. 
So we're generating stereocenters in this cyclization process. Uh, the vast majority of the time, uh, the enzymes, because they are chiral, their active sites are chiral, they will produce a single enantiomer. So because the catalyst is chiral, the activation energy leading to one enantiomer will be lower than the activation energy leading to the other enantiomer. Okay. Any questions about that? All right, so uh, squalene, uh, in addition to being the precursor to terpenes, is also the precursor to steroids. Okay, steroids are our final class of non-hydrolyzable lipids that we're discussing. And we've mentioned steroids before in class. Uh, and steroids are molecules that have this tetracyclic nucleus, these three six-membered rings fused to a five-membered ring. And they have methyl groups uh, at a couple of these fusion points. Okay. So this ring system and these methyl groups are common to the vast majority of steroids. Uh, and we name these rings. Uh, this six-membered ring over here on the left is referred to as the A ring. And then we just go B, C, and then the five-membered ring is the D ring, okay? So these rings are fused together, meaning that we have two adjacent carbons that are common to two different rings. So this is the AB ring fusion. This is the BC ring fusion. And this is the CD ring fusion, okay? We have these ring fusion points. And we have stereochemistry at these ring fusion points. We have a methyl group and a hydrogen, two hydrogens at BC, methyl group and a hydrogen at CD. And those groups can be cis or trans to each other. Most of the time they are trans, as we will mention. Uh, but in a couple cases, we'll see that they are cis. So back in chapter four, we learned about uh, a molecule called decalin. In chapter four, we learned about cyclohexane. And we learned that when you have two cyclohexane rings fused together, uh, that is referred to as decalin. Okay? Uh, and we can have uh, transfused decalin, with those hydrogens being trans to each other at the ring fusion spot. Or we can have cis decalin, where those two hydrogens are cis to each other. Okay? Which is more stable, trans or cis? Trans, why? Who would like to raise their hand and tell us why? Trent? Okay, so you can see the, the, the rings are farther apart here. We have less steric hindrance than we do uh, with cis decalin. Uh, if we look, let, let's, let's compare the chairs on the right in both structure because they're drawn the same way. So if we look at the chair on the left coming off of the chair on the right, both of these carbon-carbon bonds are equatorial. But if we look in cis decalin, one is equatorial and one is axial. So the, the second ring, one of the, the carbons is axial with respect to the, the chair we're looking at. And so we have some 1, 3 diaxial interactions when we have cis decalin uh, that are absent when we have trans decalin. So indeed, trans decalin is more stable than cis decalin. However, so most of the time we'll see trans decalin structures in steroids, but not always. There's another feature of trans decalin that is vital for the biological function of some of the steroids. And that is that transdecalin cannot undergo ring flipping, whereas cisdecalin can. Okay? We mentioned this back in chapter four, and we're, we're reminding you of it now. Uh, if you have trouble seeing this, I invite you to create models of cisdecalin and transdecalin and perform the ring flipping. And you'll find that cisdecalin can ring flip Transdecalin, when you try to ring flip it, the bonds will break, and that's a sign that it doesn't work. Okay? Uh, so why is that? I'll briefly try to describe it to you, although it's easiest if you make the models. So with cisdecalin, if we're going to flip this cyclohexane, we're going to interchange the axial and equatorial groups. So this bond, th this group is going to go from axial to equatorial. This group over here is going to go from equatorial to axial. So we still have our cyclohexane coming off of the ring 
with one group equatorial and one axial. If we try to do that here with transdecalin, both of these bonds are equatorial, and so if we try to ring flip, they would both go axial. It is impossible to have a cyclohexane fused to another cyclohexane with both bonds being axial. You just cannot span it. There's not enough, the carbon-carbon bonds are not long enough. If you tried that, these two carbons would be axial, one would be here and one would be there, and you would have to span the distance between those carbons with just two remaining carbons. It's impossible. You can't do it, okay? So that's why transdecalin does not flip. Transdecalin is more rigid than cisdecalin, okay? All right, so most steroids will have trans ring fusions, as we see here in this uh, drawing. Uh, and those trans ring fusions lead to a very rigid molecule. There's no ring flipping. Uh, and usually the methyl groups are coming off the same side of the ring, above the plane, the way it's drawn here. So those methyl groups are going to hinder the top uh, of the ring. But there's another feature to this stereochemistry that they haven't mentioned here. So we see trans ring fusion, trans ring fusion, trans ring fusion. But there's also stereochemistry connecting the ring fusions. Here we have a sigma bond connecting the AB ring fusion with the BC ring fusion. And the groups on that sigma bond are trans to each other. Here we have uh, a sigma bond connecting the BC ring fusion with the CD ring fusion. And the hydrogens are trans. We've already used the term trans, so we're going to use the term anti. So steroids are typically referred to as having trans anti-trans stereochemistry. Your book doesn't use this term, but we'll use it. We should use it because it points out the relative relationship of the stereocenters on adjacent ring fusions. Methyl group on AB ring fusion, trans or anti, we're going to use anti because we already use trans, anti to hydrogen on the BC ring fusion. Hydrogen on BC, anti to hydrogen on CD. Any questions about this nomenclature? So trans, anti, trans uh, is what we, how we refer to the stereochemistry of these steroids. Okay, so let's look at a specific steroid now. Uh, let's look at cholesterol. So in this slide, the bottom right corner, we see the structure of cholesterol. What is the function of cholesterol in nature? We briefly mentioned it on Monday. We referred to it uh, in more depth back in chapter four. Yes. Yes, it is a component of cell membranes and it imparts rigidity to those membranes. How is its structure ideally suited to making membranes rigid? Think about the stereochemistry. Yes. No ring flipping. We only have transdecalin. Here it's, it, we, we had a double bond, so we took out that trans. But here we've got transdecalin. You definitely can't ring flip with a double bond there. Uh, and we can't ring flip any of these other trans ring, ring fusions. So a very rigid molecule. No ring flipping. So it's ideal for making cell membranes rigid. Uh, and it's ideal for inserting itself into cell membranes because it is nonpolar. It has 27 carbons and one oxygen, so it's not going to be water soluble. Okay. So um, let's talk about how, well, a couple more things about cholesterol. Number one, it is our most abundant steroid. Uh, the average adult has about half a pound of cholesterol inside of them, uh, or about 200 grams. Uh, in addition to being part of your cell membranes, uh, it is also the precursor to all other steroids. So our body produces a lot of different steroid hormones, some of which we'll show you today in class. Uh, and cholesterol is the biosynthetic precursor to all of those steroid hormones. So let's take a look at how cholesterol is biosynthesized. And this is an amazing process. We're only going to hit a couple of the highlights. We start with squalene. So in addition to squalene being the precursor to um, some of those terpene uh, molecules, it is also 
the precursor to steroids. Uh, and you see here, we've drawn it in a different conformation than before. We've kind of uh, twisted the chain uh, to suggest that we're going to form some rings here. The first step in the process is epoxidation. We have one, two, three, four, five, six alkenes in squalene. Only one of those alkenes gets epoxidized. Why? Because the enzyme active site uh, has the oxidant in close proximity to this alkene. Is squalene chiral? No, squalene is not chiral. No stereocenters. Is squalene oxide the epoxide we get from squalene chiral? Yes, it is. We have a stereocenter right here. It's too bad they didn't show you the stereochemistry here. You'll only get a single enantiomer of squalene oxide uh, due to the enzyme active site being chiral. Okay? So once we make this epoxide, we now undergo this amazing cyclization. We learned last semester in Chapter 9 that if you protonate an epoxide, you make it more electrophilic. It becomes a really good electrophile when you protonate it. So that's what we're doing here. We're protonating the epoxide. We also learned that we don't form carbocations, uh, but our nucleophile attacks before a carbocation would be generated. So the way we've drawn the molecule, you can see this double bond is in close enough proximity to act as the nucleophile and attack the more substituted carbon of that epoxide, which is what happens when you protonate an epoxide. Your nucleophile attacks at the more substituted carbon. Review of chapter 9. So that would give us a tertiary carbocation, but before that tertiary carbocation can form, the neighboring alkene attacks, forming a, another six-membered ring. Before the tertiary carbocation can form here, the neighboring alkene attacks, generating another six-membered ring. Before you could get the secondary carbocation here, this double bond attacks, giving a five-membered ring and a tertiary carbocation out here. So we form four rings in one step. Okay, pretty amazing process. But we're not done. So now we have an incredible sequence. It's only one step, but it's one step that involves an incredible sequence of one, two shifts. Uh, we know that carbocations can undergo these kinds of rearrangements. Uh, if you can shift a neighboring group to generate a carbocation of equal or greater stability. So we have a, a beta hydride shift. This beta hydride shifts over. But before we get a tertiary carbocation here, we have another beta hydride shift. Before we get a tertiary carbocation here, we have a methyl shift. Before we get a tertiary carbocation here, we have another methyl shift. And that gives us this tertiary carbocation. Okay? So, pardon the pun, this is uh, carbocation shifts on steroids, uh, if you will. We've got four of these shifts happening in a single step. Now, once we get here, uh, we finally uh, deprotonate uh, and we generate a double bond here. We get lanosterol. Okay? Uh, and then you'll notice uh, we've given up trying to describe what happens between lanosterol and cholesterol. Uh, it's a long and complicated process. But if you look at the structure of lanosterol, it has 30 carbons. Cholesterol has 27 carbons. So we have to cut out these two methyl groups and then we cut out this methyl group here. Uh, removing those three methyl groups to generate cholesterol, okay? And you'll notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stereocenters in lanosterol. That's formed as a single stereoisomer, thanks to the enzyme. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stereocenters in cholesterol. Uh, again, all controlled by the enzyme, okay? So let's focus on the cyclization a little bit more because this cyclization is a really amazing step. In the 1950s, there were two chemists, uh, Gilbert Stork and Albert Eschenmoser. And they studied this reaction, and they generated a hypothesis. This figure comes from a textbook that we use uh, for an advanced organic chemistry class that we teach to our graduate students. So they hypothesized that the stereochemistry that you get in the product at those ring fusions is encoded in the stereochemistry of the alkenes present in squalene oxide. And you can see that by the way they've drawn the process and drawn the, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, transition state here. We don't actually get a carbocation. It's, it's a protonated epoxide. So they really should have drawn that as a protonated epoxide. But <clears throat> if we uh, 
we, because this is a concerted process, all of these rings form in a single step. There's no opportunity for carbon-carbon bond rotation uh, in any intermediates, because there are no intermediates. And so what that means is that groups that are trans on the double bonds in squalene oxide should be trans to each other at the ring fusion points. Okay? So we see methyl group and hydrogen, those are trans. They end up trans to each other here at carbon 6 and carbon 7. Let's look at carbon 10 and 11, methyl group, hydrogen, trans. Carbons 10 and 11 are over here, uh, methyl group and hydrogen trans. Hydrogen methyl group trans, hydrogen methyl group trans. So it all comes from the alkene stereochemistry. So the, the trans geometry at the ring fusion points is solely due to the geometry of those alkenes. That, that was the stork eschen moser hypothesis. You might wonder about the anti-nature that goes... Uh, that connects the ring fusions. The anti-geometry is coming from the fact that we have these chair-like transition states. You'll notice each of these new six-membered rings that is forming is drawn in a chair conformation. That's going to be the lowest energy conformation, so that's going to be um, on the reaction pathway. And having that chair-like geometry uh, puts your methyl group and your hydrogen anti, it's 6 and 11, uh, here it puts these two methyl groups anti. So that's how we get the trans-anti-trans stereochemistry. So trans-anti-trans stereochemistry is encoded in the stereochemistry of squalene oxide. The combination of the trans double bonds and the chair-like transition states will give you trans-anti-trans stereochemistry. Okay? So a consequence of that hypothesis is that you shouldn't need the enzyme to get this stereochemistry. You should be able to run a reaction in a flask with squalene oxide or something similar and get the same stereochemistry. And in 1971, a chemist at Stanford named W.S. Johnson did just that. Okay? Now, it wasn't exactly the same. He only formed three rings, uh, so it wasn't quite as fancy as the one in nature. But he made this tertiary alcohol, treated it with trifluoroacetic acid, loses water, you get this tertiary carbocation. He forms three rings, two six-membered rings and a five-membered ring, and he only gets trans-anti-trans because of the chair-like transition states and the trans-double bond. So he verified a stork eschen moser hypothesis, which is that we can perform similar reactions in a flask without the aid of enzymes. Of course, we need the enzymes for the other crazy stereochemistry, the, 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 those one-two shifts. There's no way we could do that in a flask. And forming squalene oxide as a single enantiomer, we need the enzyme for that as well. But the cyclization step, we don't need the enzyme. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, we're not going to go over the other steps on this uh, screen here. Uh, but I'll tell you that if you want to look at it closely, you'll see that we've learned all of the reactions that uh, uh, Professor Johnson used to synthesize progesterone. We've learned them all over the course of the year. This one here is a modification of the Wittig reaction that gives the trans as the major instead of the cis, but it is nonetheless a Wittig reaction. Okay. All right, so um, many of us have too much cholesterol. Our bodies biosynthesize uh, too much uh, cholesterol, myself included. It's a genetic issue I inherited from my dad, who had triple bypass surgery when he was age 58. Uh, and when that happened, I immediately went to the doctor and got my cholesterol checked and found out that it was elevated. And so I started taking simvastatin, which interferes with the cholesterol biosynthesis, reducing the amount of cholesterol that your body produces uh, so that uh, it won't give you arterial plaques uh, and heart disease uh, later on in life. Okay. Cholesterol is used to biosynthesize several other steroids. Uh, here are the uh, male and female sex hormones. Uh, and you'll see that the structures are not that different from each other. We'll come back to that in a moment. There are synthetic steroids derived from some of these uh, male and female sex hormones. Uh, we learned about uh, norethendrone and ethinylestradiol back in our alkyne chapter, chapter 11. Those were the first oral contraceptives. They mimic progesterone and suppress ovulation. And then we have these anabolic steroids that mimic male uh, sex hormones, stenozolol and nandrolone. Those are used to um, 
build muscle mass without adding water weight. So the reason you would want to do that uh, is if you had had a broken bone or something like that and you haven't been able to use your muscles and they were atrophying. Uh, so that's where a doctor would prescribe these anabolic steroids. Uh, but of course, uh, athletes have used them without prescriptions for performance enhancing purposes. Do not do that. I cannot emphasize that more strongly. Because these molecules are very similar to sex hormones, they have unpleasant side effects related to those sex hormones. So if you're a man, you can develop female secondary uh, sex characteristics if you take these. Right? You can grow breasts. Your testes can shrink. You can lose body hair. So I don't think you want that. All right. Uh, we have these adrenal cortical steroids. They're oxidized at C11. We won't say much about them, except cortisone is an anti-inflammatory. So if you get a cortisone shot, this is what you're getting. Uh, cortisol is hydrocortisone. If you use hydrocortisone cream on itching uh, to relieve itching, uh, that is cortisol. The last one we'll talk about is cholic acid. Cholic acid is the precursor to bile salts. Cholic acid has a cis ring fusion here. You still can't flip the molecule because the cis ring fusion is fused to a trans ring fusion. But what that does is it puts all three of the OH groups on the same face of the molecule. It makes it amphiphilic. This is a term that we learned uh, back in chapter three. We have a polar face and a nonpolar face. So our body converts cholic acid into bile salts, making a salt of the carboxylic acid. And that helps us dissolve fat. So if you eat a, a Whopper and you have this big hamburger with all this fat in it, the fat's not soluble in water. Your gallbladder will dump bile salts into your digestive system, and the bile salts will help dissolve the fats by forming a micelle type of a structure uh, with the nonpolar face pointing towards the fats inward, and then having your polar face on the outside of that structure so that the fats will dissolve. So this is how uh, the body uh, will dissolve fats. Now, uh, some people lose their gallbladder function and have to have it removed. So what happens then is your body can't regulate the production of these bile salts. They're just steadily dripping into your digestive system. And so if you overwhelm your digestive system and have a double whopper, for example, uh, then you might have trouble if you've had your gallbladder removed digesting that. It would probably be an unpleasant event for you. So if you've had your gallbladder removed, you've got to be careful at how much fat you ingest at a single time. Any questions? All right, that's it for Chapter 28. Uh, please remember to turn in your take-home quizzes on Friday, uh, and we'll start Chapter 31.